Hello friends and welcome back to my shop. In this video, we're finally going to work Meteorite into my pens because I've been wanting to do it forever and I've had a little section of Meteorite that I've just been waiting to machine. So the first step was basically to find a way to hold it. Um, it's a little slab out of a larger piece of Meteorite and it's not perfectly flat or square on any side, um, but it was flat enough that I figured if I milled a piece of aluminum down and glued to it and then screwed to it, I could probably hold it in place. And the aluminum is just there so that I can cut through it uh, and not end up hitting my vice jaws. You could probably make some soft jaws for this piece, but like I said, each piece is unique, so uh, you'd be making a lot of little soft jaws. Here I'm basically just sizing it for the width of the meteorite, putting some marked holes, and then doing some drilling and tapping so I could put screws in later uh, to hold the little piece down. Once we had everything drilled and tapped, I basically just glued it to the block. The back of this piece is flat enough uh, that I was able to get a solid amount of gluing area. Um, so I wasn't too concerned, but the screws are there just to uh, just to help. And then I'll make sure that when I do the machining, um, I, I dodge the screws. I'm also going to use the smallest cutter I have. Um, so we're going to use a 1 16th inch end mill on this mill. Um, just because I don't want to waste this material. It's, it's not horrendously expensive, but compared to any other thing I've worked in, um, it's horrendously expensive. <laughs> so uh, we'll use a 1 16th to take the minimal amount of chips away and get the most amount of parts. Most meteorites are like an iron nickel composite with who knows what kind of heat treating, um, obviously entering the atmosphere, kind of gets a little crazy. Um, so in this case, I basically just treated it, treated it as a really solid nickel alloy when I was doing my feeds and speed calculation. Uh, so the feed and speed is pretty conservative. I could definitely bump it up. Um, but once again, I just didn't want to break a tool. I didn't want to lose a part. These were my first little test pieces. Uh, so I was fine with just waiting the extra time. I found out that a little bit of oil helped cutting a lot and then just an air blast to get rid of everything. Quite manual and tedious, but uh, it produced a really nice, really nice result. Use a little brass pin here just to pop it out of the uh, existing piece. Just a little bit of skin left on the bottom to keep it from flopping around. And the next step, I'm going to pop it in the lathe and just take that little edge skin off. And then we're also going to put a slight chamfer on it. This is about 5 thou oversize right now. Um, so. I'm basically getting it indicated into my lathe um, just by eye. I'll use a little loop here in a second, boop, um, just to make sure that I'm pretty much dead on. And then I can peel that little skin off and put a chamfer on it. I'm putting a chamfer on this side as well so that it hides any mismatch. And once it's pressed into the pen, you won't see the edge, but uh, just make it as nice as I can. Here we have the little slugs. I actually was able to get about six, so uh, that's perfect. So this pen is something different. This is a full titanium bolt action pen, uh, and it's the first production unit I've made, so uh, let's geek out about it. So design-wise, it's exactly similar to every other bolt action I sell. Um, this one is sized for the Parker style refill. Uh, the only difference, or I'd say the only difference, there is so much extra hand work done to this one. Um, so this one, like I said, the whole body now is titanium. I went ahead and anodized this one purple and then uh, wet sanded it after the fact to bring it up to a full polished finish. Every single part on here is polished as well, hand polished uh, up to the same finish level which uh, is a scratch and fingerprint magnet. Uh, that's why I tumble my pens because it actually gives a finish that's uh, a lot more uh, resilient to pocket carrying. Uh, you won't scratch it up so bad. Um, but this one being almost more of a showpiece, I just had to have it polished because uh, it just, the colors pop, everything looks so good. Um, so anyways, yes, grips purple. Uh, the internal diameter on this pen has also been polished <laughs> just like the outside. Uh, so you get a super, super smooth surface for the bolt pin. Um, to ride on, um, which which is absolutely lovely. I don't want to go back to not having polished surfaces on the inside, which is good that we have a giant big lathe upstairs that we're working on now because uh, that's going to make doing crazy high surface finishes much easier. Uh, the other difference with this one compared to my other pens is this one in the back has a piece of meteorite. Normally I have a neodymium magnet pressed into the back, um, just functions as a stand and it's always nice to have a magnet on hand. Uh, but this one has meteorite in the back and I've planned to do that forever. And I'm super pumped that I worked into this design or worked into this pen. Meteorite is, um, I mean, some segments of the meteorite, I bought it in a big flat piece and then machined out some uh, discs essentially, and then put them on the lathe and then cut them to size and pressed them into here. So they're completely held by titanium all around the outside, uh, which keeps them fairly stable, even if there is a fissure or crack in them. Um, and most people will coat meteorite with like a clear coat or something like that because it's iron and nickel typically. Um, so it will have a tendency to rust with time. I think 
This one will have enough finger oils on it that that's not going to be an issue because you're constantly handling a pen. And even full steel pens I did way, 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 way back in the day when I started off doing this, uh, they wouldn't rust as long as you used them. If you let them sit for six months, they would start developing surface rust. But I just, I didn't want, I have plenty of options to coat this in clear methods. I Cerakote or just standard lacquer coatings or like automotive co coatings. Um, but I wanted nothing on it because I want to be able to touch the rock. I wanted pe people to be able to touch the rock from space. I think that's so cool. Uh, and in this pen, you can. That end is a meteorite that's been traveling through who knows where. Um, yeah, amazing. And uh, that's why my website is also super space centered because I'm a space dork and I like that stuff. And I've wanted to work meteorite into my designs forever. And uh, I'm very pumped that I did because it looks so cool. Another thing I did is uh, there's a flat on the little bolt pin that's always been there since day one. The reason is I wanted to put engravings on it. So in this one, I actually engraved a name onto that flat. And the cool thing is since that flat never touches the internal bore, uh, it'll never get scratched. So no matter how many times you cycle it, that little engraving will always stay just primo. Unless you'd like jam keys in there or something like that, but that would be excessive. So yeah, I am a, I'm super pumped about this pen. I could talk about it for days, but that's not very exciting for you guys. So yeah, they'll eventually come. I will eventually produce these in mass at the uh, insane quality level that I want to hold for this design. Uh, but right now, that's just me and wet sanding for way too long. And you don't want to pay for that. So yeah, I like it. So that purple pen turned out great. I actually have, uh, have two more blanked up and ready. I have to finish these as well. Once again, going out to special people. So uh, kind of time is, or time is no object on those ones. I know they're going to take a bunch of handwork, so that's quite all right. Um, the only reason I'm not producing those in titanium right now is just because of the handwork required. And honestly, in my opinion, paying for my time to hand finish something, to sand it, to polish it is not, there's no value in that. Um, other people will disagree. They'll say that handwork and hand finishing with its imperfections that it brings is the uniqueness. And that's, that that's important to me. Not so much. I just want to make stuff perfect. Uh, and if a machine will do it better and faster than I will, why would I not leverage the machine? That's why I'm currently already leveraging machines. That's why I drive screws in with a drill, not by hand, because it does it better and it does it faster. Um, not to say I want to crank stuff out by any means, but I don't want to waste my time. It doesn't bring me joy sitting and sanding for four hours. What brings me joy is producing something to the absolute perfection that I possibly can. And that's why we're investing in better equipment just to get to that point. And that lets me do neater stuff, neater tolerance fits and wilder designs because uh, I can physically make it happen. So that's something I'm excited for. That's what we're moving forward with. That's what's coming down the line for pens in the future. I have no idea when that date will be because I have to get the big freaking machine moving first. And then we'll talk about that. Problem with a mohawk when it gets too long is I end up looking like Fry from Futurama. Anyways, uh, as you can see with the video that I'm putting in here of me moving the lathe around, um, I spent like two hours moving the lathe. In the video, it just moves to one location, but I moved it to like four different locations in my little shop here before I finally settled on putting it there. Um, I actually didn't want to have it sitting right by the door um, just because that's going to be one of the colder areas, even with the furnace, which actually you can see it's coming along over here. Um, even with the furnace running in here in the winter, I just kind of want to have this in the most stable temperature location, um, but that's just where it fits best. Um, it makes sense with everything. And if I want to put a larger compressor in here and with the power lines and everything, anyways, that's just the best place for it right now. Uh, and it's not like I can't move it, um, pallet jacks, and you can jog that thing around quite easily. Um, the one cool thing actually is when I read through the Hardinge manual, um, I was super concerned about leveling this. So I spent a decent amount of time getting it perfectly level, but that's not important at all. Um, they did a three position or a three point torsion mount on the lathe itself. Um, and I guess the lathe itself is stiff enough um, that even despite its cabinet that it's bolted to, um, you can mount it on a wood floor. It says in the manual, as long as it's half level, um, it's not gonna have any twist issues. So that was maybe not required, but at least it's level, which makes aligning stuff down the road easier. So while you're watching this video, I'm actually working on this thing right here. Um, that's the sub panel. I got the giant freaking where is it? HR Geiger looking wire. 
um, pulled through my house and uh, ran up to the panel here. I got to finish mounting it properly and getting it all wired in. Um, all the electrical for the lay, the mill, everything else in here is going to be PVC external on the wall um, because I like the look of it uh, and it makes uh, working on it in the future a lot easier. Uh, so that's what I'm going to work on. And then once I have it almost buttoned up, I can call for my final permit inspection and then uh, everything will be hunky dory. Um, then we can start working. So my plan is to basically just start moving equipment in here Friday, this coming Friday, um, is when I start, want to start moving stuff up here um, because it's beautiful and uh, the light is nice and I'm tired of working in my cave when I see a nice area like this. And then we can actually start working on the big lathe, uh, which is I'm, I'm really, really excited for. So, yeah. I love those doors. They'll never get old. So the lathe is in its uh, spot right now where it's going to sit for the time being anyways. It's always it's easy to move with a pallet jack, so that's kind of nice. Um, I'm pretty much settled for Linux CNC uh, to run the control on this. I'm just, I'm very comfortable with it and I've been using it for like the last 10 years and uh, it's rock solid. So that's probably what I will run. Uh, I'll run a Mesa card, uh, which is a hardware interface card to kind of give better um, servo information um, instead of using step control, nerd stuff, not important. I will also probably be using um, clear path servos on the axes for this machine. Just seems like a good option. If someone has a better option, let me know. Uh, I would love to do a servo drive for the spindle. Still looking at options there, but just a two horsepower servo is uh, decently expensive. So we might end up just going with an inverter drive initially to get everything moving and then uh, play that game down the line. I found a bushel of build videos and uh, conversions and whatnot people have done on this machine the HNC and the CHNC, uh, they're a little hard to find. I'll link a bunch below just because uh, they're cool if you like reading into that old stuff, but um, pretty insane levels of uh, accuracy people have been able to pull off this. Uh, one guy has his machine that he bought 30 odd years ago, which is about the vintage of this thing. Uh, and he was able to split tenths um, while doing some turning. So if you're not in the machining world or you don't understand a lot of that measurement jargon, um, Typically, small measurements are measured in thousandths of an inch. Um, so like a sheet of paper is about two to three thousandths, but an easy way to figure it out is that a human hair is about two to three thou, um, depending on how fine your hair is. Let's assume you have fine hair. So let's assume your hair is two thou thick. Take that hair and cut it in half. Now you're down to a thousandth. When I'm talking about tenths, take that half that you've cut, cut that into 10 more segments, like split it 10 more times. Now you have one tenth of that, now split that in half again. That's splitting tenths. That's an insane level of accuracy. For me, it goes finer in the machining world, which is just mind boggling. Um, but I mean, even at that, like heat and stuff is starting to make issues um, with tolerances. But yeah, if I could get close to that on this machine, I would be so, so pumped. So yeah. The last little thing to round off my week was some actual machining. Uh, this is a little job that came in for a company called uh, Goodwood Golf. He makes uh, custom putters, um, some really nice custom putters. So if you're into this, uh, crazy game that is golf go check him out for sure instagram i'm sure you just google goodwood golf and he'll put i'll put it in the description because why not anyways these are just little bands that go on the uh putter shafts or little accent pieces uh, these ones were cut from aluminum and they look like a very simple part on the inside there's a slight taper which made the work holding a little bit different and i also wanted to be able to access all sides uh, so in this instance the little shaft slides onto or the little band slides onto a little machine taper i made there and the little set screw on the end or um, socket head cap just pinches an aluminum washer and squishes the whole thing together um, basically so it repeats quite well. It pulls on tight so I use a little piece of leather uh, to pop it off once it's finished and then uh, slide the next part on, snug it all up and that indexes pretty repeatably. Um, I had to do a bunch of these so I was trying to make life easy on myself. So once I have that clamped in place, the mill can carry on doing the uh, engraving work and then I'll take the finished piece over to the lathe and put it on another jig and that'll let me cut the edge chamfers, which I'm doing here and here. And then I'll run a light polish on the outside just to give it a nice uniform finish and uh, kick off any burrs that might have been raised during the engraving. This little holder is a little bit different. You can see it's got some splits in it uh, and basically just has a little brass uh, taper on the other end that's driven in by the screw. So it expands from the inside. And that basically lets me hold the part uh, and still have access to both ends so I can put chamfers on it or clean it up if I had to. Um, this was a little bit more involved to make, but it was actually uh, pretty easy. I just hand cut the little slits in there and uh, drilled and tapped the end and put the taper on it. So nothing super complicated, but uh, made a job like this really easy. So did a bunch of those and then uh, boxed it up and sent it off to him. I hope they work out well, but that's basically where we are at for this week. I'm going to carry on doing what I do. I hope you guys enjoy whatever it is you do, and I will see you next time. Take care.